Offering podcast in our continuing education run up to our conference in uh, January, January 19th through 21st called Remineralize and Heal Your Gut. We are doing an online education series, uh, a bunch of interviews with health experts uh, in soil science and mineralization and gut health in metabolic health. And so today's interview, we've got Jay Feldman of jfeldmanwellness.com. Jay is an independent health researcher and a coach. He also has an incredible podcast called the Energy Balance Podcast. You can find that on YouTube or Spotify. I've listened to probably 50, 60 episodes of it. It is a really great education in the metabolic health uh, domain. And so uh, I, I just want to take a minute to preface what that word means or that phrase means, metabolic health. When you hear that, when you hear anybody talking about metabolic health, what, you're, what they're talking about is the health or the functionality, whether it's excellent or poor, of mitochondria. And uh, the mitochondria are, are essentially like the power stations for the, bio, for the body. And uh, every cell, these are organelles that exist inside cells that help power those cells. And depending on the type of cell, you'll have different densities of mitochondria. Some cells, like muscle tissue, has about 100 to 200 mitochondria per cell. Uh, in the heart, it's about 5,000 per cell. In the brain, it's about 10,000 per cell. And in sperm and eggs, you have about 100 to 200,000 mitochondria per cell. And, and so the energy requirements of the cell or of the tissue that those cells make up is um, dependent upon those mitochondria and how well they function. So when you hear uh, the phrase metabolic health, what people are talking about is how well they're functioning, the mitochondria, and how do you optimize that functionality? And you'll see in this interview how uh, things like insulin resistance, obesity, uh, heart disease, uh, basically every disease, chronic disease, is at its core a metabolic problem. And that is because that is the core system upon which all the other systems are built. So if that is faulty, if it is slow, if it's impeded in some way, then you are going to have downstream effects, symptoms, dysfunction, chronic disease in a system that has that this, the, the mitochondrial dysfunction uh, that is related to that system. And that's why this is such a crucial conversation, a crucial thing to understand. And Jay in his podcast and his uh, colleague, Mike Fave, are doing an excellent job of educating people, including myself. And that's why I'm uh, honored to have him on the show today, along with Luke Rodart, who is our uh, sort of resident uh, mitochondriac and um an Olympic hopeful, part of our peace offering team. He's there on retreats. He's helping out with um, with the conference. And Luke is also a wealth of knowledge and has been a great source of education for me on this topic. So it's a real treat to have both of them together and to dive in. So, um, you know, if you need some yerba mate or some tea or some coffee to get the frontal lobe sped up a little bit to uh, tune in and... Um, catch all the details of our our uh, show then just put it on pause and uh, i hope you enjoy it yeah i would yeah i would personally like to say thank you for taking your time i know you're super busy we've took us about two months to get this on the book so uh thanks for coming on and um yeah let us know let us know about this bioenergetic model yeah definitely thanks for having me i'm, I'm looking forward to uh to the chat so yeah when we're talking about the bioenergetic view of health what we're really we're not talking about anything outside of physiology, outside of how biology works, how our bodies work, but we're looking at it through this lens that dictates that energy is the driver of our health. And so what that means is that the energy, the ATP is typically how we consider it, that's produced inside the cells. That's what allows for us to function. It allows for every cell to function, every organ to function, and allows for us to function and to have health. And the situations where that is not happening efficiently or effectively leads to degeneration and health 
issues, health diseases or, or diseases, uh, de- you know, all sorts of chronic problems that so many of us are facing or just not feeling our best. And so, again, this is the framework, but this is something that is seen throughout physiology, whether we're looking at any sort of neurodegenerative condition, whether we're looking at an autoimmune condition, whether we're looking at fatty liver disease or insulin resistance, or I'm sure a number of things that we'll be talking about today, it we see this play out in every single disease state, every single situation. And, and so by correcting or improving our ability to produce energy, we can resolve those issues and we can improve our health and feel better. And so as a health coach, that's what I help people do. And then uh, you know, I have a podcast and whatnot to to help teach people about this lens as well. So, um, you know, another way of saying this maybe is metabolic health. And, um, and so, you know, I'm curious, like in the pathway of say, the, you know, the from all the way through to the end of cellular respiration, do you see a particular bottleneck in there for people that is typically the problem? Or, or is it usually occurring at different stages for different people. What's your, what's your kind of view on this? Mm -hmm. So in terms of the inputs from our environment, we can, and again, this is where the view comes in is we can look at all of these things in terms of how they affect our capacity for energy production. So we can look at different macronutrients. We can look at different micronutrients. We can look at other factors from our environment, whether we're talking about light or heavy metals or some supplements or certain inputs from our intestines, from our gut, and consider how they affect our capacity for energy production. And there are different places it can happen. The most central one tends to be in the last section of mitochondrial respiration, which is the electron transport chain, tends to be the most sensitive in the area where most inhibition happens, if there is inhibition. And there's, you know, there's four complexes there that will tend to, where we'll tend to see those problems occur. Sometimes they'll happen directly farther up, either in the Krebs cycle or sometimes in glycolysis or beta oxidation. But typically what's happening is in that last section, which is the electron transport chain where we actually produce the ATP, that's normally where the problems happen. And then it causes problems upstream uh, in those earlier parts. So if you could um, maybe cite, you know, what you think are the say top three causes for that problem in the ETC. Yeah. So the top ones I would say would be for one polyunsaturated fats. So these are the omega sixes and omega threes that we have been told for quite a while are healthy, but are actually really effective at disrupting our ability for effectively producing energy, efficiently producing energy. And we can dig into why, but that would be probably the top one. Uh, Another, I would say the next most common one would be endotoxin. And sometimes when you say something like endotoxin, people might have a reflex that we're talking about some, something, you know, when you say toxin, I think people have, uh, sometimes have a reflex there that we're not talking about something that's actually physiologically there, but endotoxin is just a name for a compound called lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of bacterial cell walls, bacteria that are in our intestines. And it's also something that they produce. And when we're in a state where our gut health is not ideal, we're producing excessive amounts or there's permeability in the intestines, we absorb endotoxin. And this is really effective at impairing function at the electron transport chain. Uh, so much so that if you have too like too much, you will, you'll die. And that's um, typically the uh, state of sepsis, or, you know, sepsis where that leads to death. So it's a pretty impactful uh, mitochondrial toxin. And so those would probably be the top two. After that, maybe we'd be looking at something like nutrient deficiencies or you know, some other stress, like general stress, which we can talk about how that relates. There's a number of other factors. I mean, as far as things that people are commonly doing, you know, low carb diets and fasting are certainly things that aren't helping. And we can talk about those as well, you know, but uh, that would be some of the top things that normally at least I'm seeing and in the literature we see have major effects. Great. Um, And, and I guess the other sort of general question I have is when people think about metabolic health, uh, you hear a lot of the various, um, you know, alternate, uh, alt health doctors, functional medicine practitioners using metrics like fasting insulin and fasting glucose as the sort of core metric for how healthy you are metabolically. Um, I, it, 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 
from your view or the bioenergetic view, how important is that? And where, at what point in this whole cycle are they influencing the situation or not influencing the situation? Yeah. And even a step back, you know, you were saying how, like when people are talking about metabolic issues or when people are talking about mitochondrial dysfunction and just to, just to comment on that first, I think that it's become a bit of a buzzword, but tends to, tends to be more of a reductionist approach when people tend to say those things. They're not actually talking about what improves our capacity for energy production. They're looking at some somewhat arbitrary external factor and saying that that's causing metabolic problems. But I think most people who would say that, you know, we would have a pretty different view in terms of what, what actually the problems are. And I'm sure that'll become clear as, as we go through this. But in terms of the question of things like glucose, fasting insulin, or hemoglobin A1C as markers of our metabolic state, they can be good markers, but there are some caveats there. So what these are telling us in a state where we're consuming some amount of carbohydrates is essentially how insulin sensitive we are. And insulin sensitivity is, again, another area where I think there's, there have been, there's a misconception. I mean, even just the name itself, I don't think is very accurate, a very accurate way to, uh, to depict or describe what's going on. Because in insulin resistance, the problem is not actually that the cells become resistant to insulin signals, or at least that's not the essential problem. The essential problem happens underneath that, where there's a metabolic problem in the cell, leading to impairment in glucose utilization, which then downstream will lead to impairment in glucose uptake. And this is really independent of insulin. But what happens as a result is then the glucose is not coming into the cells. We end up in a chronic stress state and we end up with higher insulin. So insulin as a blood marker can be an indication of insulin resistance, or it can be an indication of how good our metabolism is. And so we would generally want to see lower insulin levels. Same with fasting glucose. We would generally want that to be lower because if it's elevated, it's a sign that our cells aren't using the glucose well, so they're not taking it up well. Uh, same thing with hemoglobin A1C. Again, it's just kind of another marker of our general blood glucose levels. The problem comes in when we take the markers as the problem instead of actually seeing what the underlying issue is. And if we say the problem is glucose, the problem is insulin, we just need to stop consuming carbohydrates to lower those things. We're not actually fixing the underlying metabolic issue. We're just avoiding it by avoiding the usage of carbohydrates and relying on other systems like fat burning, fat oxidation. And so that's not actually representative of an improvement in metabolic function. It's just an avoidance of the issue. So that's when we have to be careful about A, interpreting the blood work, and B, the recommendation to simply avoid anything that increases glucose or insulin to resolve insulin resistance. A very helpful, I think, analogy, because a lot of the people who are making that suggestion are coming from this place, is that these are just symptoms of a problem, right? Like firemen coming to a fire, they're the reactive aspects of our physiology. And a very parallel example is in heart disease. So we tend to see elevated levels of cholesterol, blood cholesterol, you know, lipids in heart disease. And what a lot of people have come to recognize is that those aren't actually the issue or the causative factors, but rather they're not only innocent bystanders, but they're actually a part of the protective response to underlying damage that might be going on in the vasculature. And so we don't want to blame cholesterol for that issue. We don't want to blame the firemen for the fire. And the same is true in the case of blood sugar and insulin levels when it comes to insulin resistance. These increases in, in blood sugar levels or in insulin are reactions to the problem. They aren't actually the problem themselves. Luke, um, you want to jump in here? I think you're, you're kind of teed up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm curious what recommendations you give to people who are showing signs of metabolic dysfunction, dysfunction, insulin resistance, and elevated fasting blood glucose. So the, when we're faced with any issue, but you know, in this case, a very general one, right? Not something that's particularly unique because there's so many things that can go into our metabolic health or our ability to use the glucose. So the first question would be what seemed to be the main factors driving the state for this individual? So, you know, we talked about some of the more common things that impact this process, starting with polyunsaturated fats. If this person is consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fats, that'd be a great place to start, right? Reducing that the intake of those. 
Another place would be gut health. If this person is dealing with what seems to be major bacterial overgrowths and they're feeding those with you know, a lot of fibrous or fermentable foods, that's going to be leading to a lot of endotoxin and that's going to impair our ability to utilize glucose. And that's seen, by the way, in mild endotoxemia or metabolic endotoxemia is seen in diabetes and obesity and whatnot. So those would be the first two things I would check off. I mean, I would also be looking at nutrient density of the diet, you know, making sure we're getting the B vitamins and magnesium and sodium, you know, all sorts of things that are involved in mitochondrial respiration and our ability to use uh, glucose. So those would be some starting places. Uh, sometimes it can be that simple. And, you know, we take someone who's been eating a heavily suboptimal diet, maybe a standard American diet, and we just need to switch them even just to whole foods. And we don't even worry about need to worry so much about the details. Sometimes that's enough. Oftentimes we need to get into those details a bit more. But. Yeah. So to back up and go down the polyunsaturated pathway really quick, what's your take on the importance of the consumption of things like EPA and DHA in terms of their contribution to the malleability and flexibility of our cellular membranes and the ratio of those omega-3s compared to omega-6s like conjugated linoleic acid or linoleic acid? Yeah. So there's a question of essentiality and there's a question of then benefit versus harm, I suppose. And so the, the first thing to consider is there is a need for some omegas, so to speak. However, when we don't consume very many omega-6s or omega-3s, and this requires very low amounts, we produce omega-9 fats, which is a mead acid. And those tend to replace the omega-3s and omega-6s in the membranes and whatnot. So that's one thing to, to consider there. But the, the larger consideration, I would say, is not whether they're essential, because it's almost impossible to get below the essential needs for omega-6s and omega-3s. If we're just eating a diet that has some amount of fat, we're pretty much going to get at least a couple of grams there between the different polyunsaturated fats. And that covers the needs because even the mainstream idea of what's essential is very, very small in terms of, of the omega-6s and omega-3s. And the question of whether they're actually essential is, I mean, I, I think it should be questioned. I don't think it's it's quite clear cut. And the research is from back in the 30s from the Burrs. And they back at that time, what they did was they fed animals of fat-free diet and with no omega-6s or omega-3s. And the rodents started to have skin issues and growth issues. What was found out, you know, I think just several years later, I want to say it was toward the end of the 1930s, was that there were certain vitamins, I think it was vitamin B6 in particular, that hadn't been, dis been discovered prior. And when they just provided vitamin B6, and I believe zinc as well, it prevented those issues from the essential fatty acids. There's some other nuance there, but, uh, you know, in short, I, I think essentiality is a relatively moot point because it's, even if you are going to argue for it, it's a tiny, tiny amount. But then the question is, is it better to have more omega-3s and omega-6s? And as you said, does the ratio matter? And there's been a lot of recognition that the omega-6s are problematic. And this is because they're known to be the drivers of, not the drivers, they're, they're known to increase inflammation due to what are called the eicosanoids that they produce. So these are just downstream metabolites that are produced from the omega-6s and they tend to increase inflammation. And so because of that, people recognize like this is probably not, not a good idea to be getting a lot of these. And, uh, you know, they tend to be increasing inflammatory processes. Uh, but I would say that's not really the main concern that I would have with them. Instead, my concern when it comes to the polyunsaturated fats is it mostly comes down to their instability. So for reference, these are the fats that are typically liquid at room temperature. Uh, monounsaturated fats will be as well, but the polyunsaturated fats, we're looking at the vegetable oils, especially, you know, the seed oils, fish oil. And they also tend to be very, very sensitive to damage from UV light or from heat. And because of that, if you're, let's say, trying to eat a, you know, or use a flax oil supplement or a fish oil supplement, it needs to be really well kept in refrigeration and, you know, a dark bottle to prevent, you know, the sunlight from impacting it and damaging it. And even so, most products on the shelf, uh, as far as omega three goes, omega threes go, uh, are already damaged, already oxidized, and have levels beyond. I think it's the FDA that that creates those standards. But we then take these outside of their amber bottles and the the cold refrigeration or dark space, and put them into our bodies, which are typically operating ideally at you know ninety eight point six degrees Fahrenheit, 
have, you know, all sorts of biochemical processes going on that are pretty dangerous when we have instable or unstable fats. And it's been shown that even just the digestion of these things is enough to create considerable damage to them, considerable peroxidation. And then after the digestion, we absorb them, we might metabolize them, but typically what will happen is we'll use them as structure because fats are an important structural component, as you said, of the, of the membranes of the cells, the membranes of the mitochondria. And they're also, you know, backbones for hormones and whatnot, or precursors to hormones. And so when we begin to use them as structure, especially in an area like the mitochondria, which is right, the engine of the cell, there's a lot of oxidative processes going on there. And the more unsaturated fats that we're incorporating in there, the more oxidative damage we see, and also the less efficient respiration runs. And the efficiency is a separate uh, concern from the oxidation. And that's actually happening because of the inherent kind of what you said, like the uh, flexibility, so to speak, of the membrane, the the fluid nature of them. Because the, the polyunsaturated fats have these extra double bonds, it creates space and it creates fluidity, which also creates permeability. So essentially the membranes, whether we're talking the plasma membrane or the mitochondrial membranes, become less sealed, less well sealed, and less solid. And this actually increases permeability to different ions that we don't want to be permeable to these membranes. So inside of the mitochondria, the whole way that we produce energy is by creating a proton gradient, meaning that we're pumping these H plus ions, these protons, all the way to one side of the inner mitochondrial membrane to the extra mitochondrial space and creating this charge differential like a battery to then produce ATP. And kind of like a, I think another good analogy is a hydroelectric dam, right? So we have a lot of water on one side, not so much on the other. And we have a, a big dam with some sort of a wheel that we're spinning or something like that with the water that just comes through one little area. And the polyunsaturated fats are like weak bricks or like holes in that dam that's causing the water to leak through and reducing the amount of power and energy we can produce by pushing the water through the area that we want to actually produce the energy. And that would be an even bigger concern. And this is such a big, like, like this is, it's almost impossible to understate how much this impacts our capacity for energy production. So much so that there is uh, what I would say is the most convincing theory of aging, which is called the membrane pacemaker theory of aging. And just for reference for anyone listening, a theory doesn't mean like a, a hypothesis. It's it's more of a tested hypothesis that has uh, that is very well backed. You know, in science, a theory is pretty much a it's just below a law, but it's you know about the strongest. Um, form of, of suggestion that we have or evidence. And so the membrane pacemaker theory of aging suggests that the amount of polyunsaturated fats in the membrane is so impactful. That this is the number one determinant of aging and lifespan across all species. So this is the reason why we live longer than mice and why elephants live longer than, I don't know, uh, what other animals can we come up with? I don't know. I, I'm hesitant because things like birds actually live quite a bit longer than you would expect because of this, this impact. Uh, but if you were to pick any animals, the reason why we have such major differences in lifespan is actually because of the amount of polyunsaturated, um, polyunsaturated fats that are in the membrane and how unsaturated they are. And so when you change that composition, it dramatically affects how efficiently we're producing energy. And it also affects how well we how stable we can hold that energy. And the other factor that happens is not only are those membranes permeable to things like protons, but also ions like sodium and potassium. And so the pumps that are supposed to keep the sodium out of the cell and the potassium in the cell, those require ATP. And when the membranes are more leaky, we have to use those a lot more to keep the proper amounts of potassium in and sodium out. And that wastes a huge amount of energy as well. And so those couple of things together it's essentially like we have a, you know, a leaky battery, right? With the sodium and potassium ions and other ions too. And also we have the leaky dam, which is trying to produce the energy. And so those things have a massive, massive impact. And to, you know, kind of leave it at, at this last point, which is we can look at all these impacts of, with the omega-6s and the omega-3s typically have an extra double bond relative to the omega-6s. So they are extra unstable. They're typically twice as unstable. If you compare, uh, you know, for example, like I think if you compare DHA and I don't know if it would be arachidonic acid or linoleic acid, but anyway, the omega-3s are 
considerably more unstable relative to the omega sixes. So in all of the places that we'd be concerned about the omega sixes being here, the omega threes are that much more concerning. I see. Um, so, it, oh, Jonathan, go ahead. No, go ahead. I can wait until I can wait until you're done. All right. I, the, so it's less advantageous to utilize these polyunsaturated fatty acids for structural purposes at the level of the cell. And so a more stable fat, like a monounsaturated or saturated fat, sounds like is a more ideal building block for cellular membranes. Yeah, exactly. And even within the polyunsaturated fats, the less unsaturated ones are better. So there are some studies where they use DHA, for example, which is one of the most unsaturated fats we have available. And replacing linoleic acid with DHA in the membranes is considerably worse, leads to much worse outcomes in terms of oxidative stress and energy production. Okay. Do you have um, upper limits of PUFA intake daily that you you uh, generally coach people in? My general recommendation is trying to limit it to a max of four grams per 2000 calories. And in general, lower is better, but also the caveat there is they are unavoidable, right? If we're eating whole good quality foods, there's always going to be, you know, a bit of polyunsaturated fats in there, whether we're talking butter or beef or, you know, uh, dairy, what a, what, I guess I could cover that with butter, but any fats that we're talking about, there's typically some amount of unsaturated fats in there. So minimizing them, I would say the much bigger fish to fry, so to speak, and I guess pun intended would be fatty fish, which are very high in omega-3s, the vegetable oils and quote seed oils, you know, canola, safflower, sunflower, uh, soy oil, all of those and nuts and seeds. And the last category would be fatty fish, or sorry, fatty chicken and fatty pork, in addition to fatty fish. Those tend to be the biggest offenders. And so if we're avoiding those, you know, that that makes by far the biggest difference. Is there a time frame uh, which it takes to get these out of the tissue um, and, you know, the so-called like PUFA depletion time scale? And um, are there mitigation methods during that time period um, that can kind of help patch the wall or, or help with prevent the oxidation or mitigate it? Mm -hmm. So in the research, looking at changing the entire body's tissue, where they're often, often the last one of the changes is going to be adipose tissue or fat tissue, whereas the changes in phospholipids or fatty acid. So the phospholipids in our red blood cells or in our liver, or skeletal muscle, those will change quicker on the order of months um, or sometimes even weeks. When it comes to changing the adipose tissue fully over, it can be three to five years, depending on how much there is and what we're doing during that time. And the the only thing I'd mention on that front is we don't necessarily want it to be too much faster because if we try to flood ourselves or clear out that adipose tissue as quickly as possible, we will be flooding ourselves with the exact fats we're trying to avoid in large amounts. And so I would rather do that a bit slower and allow for some of the detoxification processes to work, which we actually have ways of detoxifying these fats without metabolizing them without incorporating them by going through the glucuronidation pathway in the liver. And so that would be one avenue through which we can clear them and we will metabolize them a little bit as well, but we don't want to be flooded with massive amounts. It would be like eating massive amounts. So it's almost better on the adipose side that we do give that some time. In that time period, while we're making those shifts, one, well, there's a couple of things that could generally help. One is vitamin E, a good quality vitamin E which can help protect against the peroxidation of the polyunsaturated fats. And normally if you see polyunsaturated fats in nature, you know, in seeds or nuts, there's some vitamin E there to help protect them. Um, so that would be one thing I generally recommend if someone's eaten a lot of PUFA over their recent history. Otherwise, making sure to get enough of the mono and saturated fats can help to, you know, replace the, the polyunsaturated fats. And yeah, otherwise I would say we don't want to focus on things to speed up that process. We don't want to focus on a lot of lipolysis, a lot of fat release, because we'll just be faced with a lot of the polyunsaturated fats. And so I'd rather have that be a, a slightly slower process with the idea in mind that there's always some lipolysis going on. And then if we add any activity, whether we're walking or running or swimming or whatever it is, we'll be increasing that lipolysis already. 
really don't need to do anything extra beyond those things. We'll already be getting enough. And uh, yeah, that'll start to, to change the composition there. Can you speak more on the de detoxification process of PUFAs? I mean, you mentioned vitamin E and exercise. But what was the first one that you mentioned? So there's the metabolism, right? We would burn them in the mitochondria just as if they're another fat, which is fine. There's actually not an issue with that as long as they're not getting damaged first and creating a lot of reactive oxygen species and, and worse, you know, worse free radicals and whatnot. Uh, but there's a pathway in the liver. We have a few different detoxification pathways. One of them is called glucuronidation. And so the, it's actually been shown that we can uh, glucuronidate and then excrete, I, I believe it would be through the urine, uh, these fats. So they would get picked up by the liver, they'd go through this process, and then I believe it's a, a glucose that gets attached to them or so, something very similar. And then they get excreted through the kidneys, through the urine. And so we don't even have to be faced with them. They don't get incorporated at all. As far as how much that's going to contribute to us clearing out those fats, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen anything quantifying it, but it's, it's a possible contributor. Luke, you got any more questions about PUFA before we shift gears? No, I think that was a great summary. Great. I will maybe one more comment because you mentioned the omega-3, omega-6 ratio. And I'm not convinced that that matters as much as just lowering the overall PUFA intake. As I was saying, replacing the omega-6s with omega-3s can even be worse for oxidative damage and mitochondrial function. And in some of the healthiest populations we see, like the Maasai, who generally consume a very low PUFA diet, their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is very high. Uh, I think it's seven to one, maybe between seven and eight. And of course, they're free from heart disease and, and generally very healthy. And uh, uh, when you look at the membrane phospholipids, they actually have lower omega-6s in there, even though they have, have this high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And that's just because the overall amount is much lower. They're consuming very little PUFA. So I would say the total amount that we consume matters much more than any ratios. Great. Um let's let's dig into endotoxin a little bit more um it, you know you 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 mentioned this being a major contributor to uh the slowing or reductive stress occurring in electron you didn't use that word i'm just throwing that i'm assuming that's what you meant um and that for the most part this seems to be gut based and um and you know you do a great job with mike in your first couple episodes talking about how the gut should be functioning and looking at that anatomically compared to other animals, scavengers, carnivores, omnivores. And, um, that was really, you know, it's bizarre. I've run a bunch of GI maps and been in this kind of functional medicine space, looking at gut health, and no one has talked about it that way, uh, which went after you did seems so obvious. And I wonder if you can give us just a, a short intro to that, because I think that it informs a lot of the, the sort of dietary, um, risks and benefits that you, uh, and how you categorize foods, uh, carbohydrate inputs anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in general, when we, and I do think it's really helpful, right. To compare just our anatomy with other animals, just as a starting place to get an idea. And so if you compare our digestive anatomy with the a more extreme example, like a cow, our small intestines are relatively large. Our large intestines are relatively small. <laughs> no, that's a little, um, you know, it, it can be complicated but, or confusing. But, uh, and then our stomachs are very acidic. And if we compare that to a cow, which again, they're ruminants. So they have a completely different looking digestive system where they have essentially four stomachs that go through various levels of fermentation, huge amounts of bacteria. And that's, and then, and essentially they rely heavily on fermentation. And the reason for that is because they consume a nearly all fiber diet from grass. You know, they get some nutrients and whatnot, but it's essentially mostly fiber, which then feeds this massive amount of bacteria that they have in their gut. And those bacteria produce short chain fatty acids from the fibers that are coming in. And those short chain fatty acids are what actually the cow uses as fuel. And this is very, very different from us, right? We don't have any of the apparatuses for major amounts of fermentation like that. And when we start to compare us to much more similar organisms like uh, in the ape family, when we look at gorillas and chimps, gorillas also have a very large 
uh, large intestine. So it's not exactly the same as a cow, but the large intestine, the colon is the part where we have the bacteria or are supposed to have the bacteria as opposed to the small intestine where we're not supposed to have the bacteria. And the large intestine is where the fermentation occurs. So gorillas in a similar way to cows consume tons of very, very fibrous foods, uh, you know, leaves and twigs and whatnot. And ferment them or they get fermented in the large intestine by this massive amount of bacteria. And, you know, if you think of a gorilla, they've got these big, you know, big bellies and uh, produce a lot of short chain fatty acids as a result. And that's a large portion of what their fuel is, is those short chain fatty acids from the bacteria. When we look at chimps, chimps are much more similar to us. They have much smaller, large intestines and a larger, uh, small intestine. And what that suggests very similar to their diet is that they don't rely a lot on fermentation. They consume much less fibrous foods and they rely a lot more heavily on fruits. Typically, I believe this is the bonobos. They'll have 60 to hundred percent of their diet from fruits. And then they also eat a good amount of insects and, you know, some protein sources like that, some animal protein sources, and, uh, they will eat, you know, some amount of vegetation too, but it's very, very little. And our digestive systems are much more similar to the chimps where we don't want to be fermenting a lot of food and producing all these short chain fatty acids for our own fuel. Instead, we want to be consuming things that are easily digested, digested up higher in the small intestine where we absorb the nutrients directly from the food. And when you look across the apes, and this is something that's uh, supported by the expensive tissue hypothesis, what they essentially find is that the less energy that gets spent on extensive digestion, the more energy is available for other organ systems and especially the brain. And so what they find is that the animals that spend much more energy on digestion, like the gorillas, which have this you know very long digestive process, very large, large intestines with a lot of fermentation, uh, you know, just as an example, compared to the chimps, which use a lot less energy on digestion, there's a correlation with brain function and size. And you see that across apes. And, and along with that, you see fruit consumption as the other factor where the more fruit consumption also tends to correlate with better brain function and, and larger brain size. And so with the consideration that on that spectrum of cows and then gorillas and then chimps, we're much more similar to those chimps where we want to be eating easily absorbable foods. We don't want to be filling up on very fibrous foods. Uh, you know, of course, we're not eating grass, but a lot of salads and raw vegetables and whatnot, which are not ideal and uh, would cause a lot of fermentation in the colon. And so we want to rely on the easily digestible fruits and, you know, honey and um, maple syrup on, on the carbohydrate side, some cooked starches, which as opposed to raw starches, raw starches are very hard to break, uh, break down and digest, but cooked starches are generally well broken down and absorbed. And then on the protein side, we would want, you know, easily digestible and broken down protein from animal sources, which we break down effectively with a very acidic stomach. And so that's kind of the general anatomical comparison and then how it relates to the food intake. And then the last piece to connect that with endotoxin is since we're not supposed to be fermenting and use, relying heavily on the bacteria, when we start to do that excessively, especially in a in the context of things like raw vegetables and grains and, and whatnot, we tend to cause major overgrowth of bacteria relative to what's normal for us. And they end up inundating us with a lot of endotoxin. And as we're talking about, that's one of the most effective ways to block energy production. And this is why it's implicated in pretty much every chronic disease state. So um, for, for humans or bonobos, this is much more of a reliance on stomach acid, pancreatic enzyme, bile for upper upper GI digestion. You know, you're absorbing the small intestine, but you're utilizing that initial sort of uh, digestive stomach, you know, area to break these things down so you can absorb them. And and then, you know, there there is fermentation happening, but you want it to happen in the large intestine and you not in the small intestine and because you want to basically exit through the small intestine as quickly as possible. And, and so, you know, uh, now we sort of get into the microbiome because um, there is, you know, a lot of research and a lot of discussion. Um, it's about it, it you know, in, in a very reductionistic way, just like everything else. But um, is your view that you want, um, <laughs> 
you know, you think it's ideal to have lower total microbial composition in in the large intestine, or is the issue more about the diversity in the species that are there um, with regard to endotoxin, um, you know, gumming up the ETC? What What's your view on this? So typically I would say we don't want to have a lower bacterial population in terms of the beneficial bacteria. Do you think there are beneficial bacteria? We can talk about what might promote those gr the growth of those versus the growth of more harmful ones. But normally if we're seeing, you know, if we're looking at the spectrum of just bacterial count, the ones that are the people who have higher bacterial count are normally due to major overgrowths. And those are not going to be of the beneficial bacteria, so to speak, typically. Uh, typically it's going to be the harmful ones that have overgrown. And largely, there's also a lack of the commensal ones, a lack of the beneficial ones, because those are the ones that help to keep the bad guys in check, so to speak. And the other piece is we want our small intestine to be pretty clear of bacteria. And if there's a lot of bacteria grown in the small intestine, which is called a, a condition called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that poses a major problem. Because now, even if we're consuming relatively easily digestible foods, there's competition between us and those bacteria for the consumption of those foods. And so it can cause more issues and also is just at baseline a much larger problem, much bigger problem since we should have a pretty clear small intestine and there's no competition there in terms of beneficial bacteria to clear out the harmful ones. So it's a very common issue uh, and a pretty major problem. But did that answer the question? Uh, yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about um, about some of these beneficial bacteria that are, you know, and again, we're in the domain of the large intestine for those of you that are following this. Um, you know, my understanding is that uh, acromancy is a really important one uh, for maintaining that mucin layer. And, and so I kind of would like to start there with you. It sounds like you're familiar with that. And how, uh, how much of, uh, how much of a problem is LPS if you have a strong mucin layer because you've got adequate acromancia doing its job. You know, like, is it going to pass through and cause and cause an inflammatory response or pass through and get to this portion of the mitochondria you don't want it to get to? So we always have a quantification question, right? I mean, we're never going to have zero endotoxin production in the gut and not all gram negative bacteria are inherently problematic. And it's also just for reference, and not that you're saying this, but I tend to use endotoxin to encompass any bacterial toxins because there's ones produced by gram positive bacteria as well. Lipotychoic acid LTA is like the parallel one to LPS. So uh, it's a potential problem anytime there's a larger amount. And if there is a large enough amount of endotoxin, it will directly create an inflammatory state in the intestine and cause intestinal permeability. Now, is there probably a balance where the stronger, you know, the, the healthier the lining is, maybe the stronger the mucin layer, it takes more endotoxin to create that permeability? Maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's really been looked at. And, and I'm sure there's, I mean, it's, it definitely matters, right? If we have a much healthier gut, it's going to take a lot more to cause a problem. But the presence of enough endotoxin will cause intestinal permeability on its own. And so I would say, just sealing the leaky gut, so to speak, is not enough to prevent this issue. So you are, you know, it's like one, reinforce the barrier, two, make sure you have enough of the beneficials, three, make sure that you're not feeding the harmful ones through the fermentable fibers. Yeah, or, or through specific fermentable fibers. And I would probably, so I would think of it in reverse order, right? We don't want to support the growth of the harmful ones and maybe we need to clear them out. We do want to make sure that we're supporting the growth of the beneficial ones. And as a result of that, the intestinal lining should be in a good place, right? We shouldn't have much in the way of intestinal permeability, but if we need extra support there, I think it's, you know, I don't have a, an objection to it. But when it comes to the actual feeding there, if we're use, if we don't, if we aren't starting with a major overgrowth, because if we are clearing it out as normally necessary, but if we aren't starting with the major overgrowth, the fibers from fruits and well-cooked vegetables alongside the polyphenols is typically an effective way for just feeding the beneficial ones. And this is because of the selective uh, effects of the polyphenols where they tend to have selective antimicrobial effects and only kill off the ones that are relatively harmful to us. 
And then with the fibers, we also have selective feeding and this whole chain of, of production of different fuels from different bacteria. Uh, you know, for example, people talk a lot about butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid that's produced from certain prebiotic fibers. And butyrate is the main fuel for acromantia. And you just have this whole chain of different, uh, different bacteria kind of feeding off each other in this very cohesive way. Uh, but what I would say again on what's that? Yeah. Cross feeding. Yeah. I yes. Say, yeah. Kind of... Yeah. And what I will say is I don't think it is coincidental that the polyphenols in, in fruits, vegetables, herbs tend to selectively kill off the really harmful bacteria or, you know, candida fungus, whatever it is, but rather I would say that that's because we developed alongside them. And those are what led to us getting to where we are now. And along with that, our microbiome has been a product of consuming those types of things. And so DV, and that's kind of what we've existed with and what we've developed to exist with. And so deviation from that is where we have what are harmful bacteria to us. And uh, yeah, I think it's, again, it's a pretty cohesive system. I think there's a lot of similarities too in the plant kingdom where the whole reason for polyphenols and other defensive chemicals are to kill pests and keep bacteria away from the fruits, um, you know, and, and so it, I think it's a, it's a very cohesive picture with all organisms, but we see that play out in the gut. Great. Luke, any thoughts on this? Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's a Goldilocks principle here because we need some amount of fermentation of these fibers to produce these short chain fatty acids to feed things like acromancia and other colonocytes, but too much or too little is going to have downstream effects that are inherently negative. So I'm curious how much fiber you recommend, what sources and how much of that is insoluble versus soluble. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll, I'll speak to that. And also I would say it's not only Goldilocks in terms of amount of fiber and feeding the bacteria, but the other digestive processes too, right? If we're producing enough bile, that's one of the main ways that we keep the small intestine clear because bile is a pretty effective antibiotic in the small intestine. If we have very poor bile flow, then that can allow for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If our motility is slow, right? Just from a lack of the contraction or not enough fiber or whatever, the, the issue is a low thyroid state, that's also going to allow for overgrowth of bacteria. Again, regardless of what we're eating, just because they have the time to consume, you know, to continue to consume what's there and ferment excessively. So there's a lot of kind of Goldilocks ranges, so to speak, with with, e with each part of the digestive process. You know, same with stomach acid. If our stomach acid is low, not only are we prone to infection in the stomach, like H. pylori, but also poorly digested protein, which will then feed bacteria as well. And that's pretty harmful to have excess protein feeding the colonic bacteria and they produce all sorts of nasty compounds. So uh, there's a number of considerations here. The good news with each of these things is typically symptoms will help us dictate exactly where we are on those spectrums and how much we can handle, right? So if our bile flow is an issue, we'll notice that if we're eating too much fat, we might have loose stools. We might you know, have gurgling. We might notice like fat, fatty stools. Uh, like a lack of fat digestion. And we see a similar thing with fiber too. If we are dealing with some level of harmful bacterial, you know, imbalance, microbial imbalance, and consuming fiber, even a small amount causes irritation, causes bloating, causes gas, causes brain fog, uh, causes skin issues, triggers autoimmune issues. Well, then we know we probably have a pretty major overgrowth that we need to deal with. And we probably shouldn't be eating very much fiber or fermentable carbohydrate in a state like that. As we get to a more optimal state, I think we could maybe talk about what that looks like. But to be honest, it's not something I think about too much um, as far as the exact amount of fiber that might be optimal there. I think a healthy diet would involve a good amount of fruit and cooked roots and cooked vegetables. Uh, maybe not a good amount, but an amount. Um, I would I would look at cooked vegetables as really a supplement to the diet, whereas you know cooked roots and and fruits, those are you know, major fuels, major food sources. And if we're getting those, you know, probably we're in the 20 to 40 grams of fiber per day range. And I know it's a wide range, but I think somewhere in there is probably optimal for most of us if we're in an optimal digestive state. You mentioned as a potential third or fourth um, cause for this slowing of the electron transport chain is uh, perhaps nutritional deficiencies. 
And um, so, so talk to us about this a little bit. What do you think are the most common ones? Yeah, so we have, on one hand, issues with food intake. Most people are not consuming particularly nutrient-dense diets, whether that's B vitamins or minerals like zinc and magnesium and calcium, potassium. I mean, most people are, are just not getting enough of, of most of these, and, you know, and the more, uh, you know, we have like man manganese and copper and whatnot, you know, the ones that we need much smaller amounts of. Very few people are, you know, eating organ meats, very few people are relying on non-processed foods. And, you know, so in that regard, a lot of nutrient deficiencies are common. And it can really be anywhere along that spectrum. I think fat soluble vitamins, specifically vitamin A is one that a lot of people aren't getting from their diet. Um, and I, I do recommend people take a look at what they're eating and, and take a look at, you know, where their macronutrients are. And if they're consistently getting low amounts, a try to get more from the food and B potentially consider supplementation when it comes to specifics for mitochondrial respiration. Some of the ones that I see as the most effective or the ones that make the biggest difference tend to be the B vitamins, especially the, the non methylated ones. So not as much the folate B12 side, but more of the B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, and biotin. Those tend to be the ones that are most involved. Uh, magnesium is pretty heavily involved as well in terms of uh, respiration. So those would be the main ones that are, I would say, most intimately tied. But a deficiency in any of them can trigger stress, which can then indirectly cause issues. You know, if we're not getting enough sodium, then we're going to trigger the activity of the RAS system and aldosterone. That can trigger swelling. It causes the loss of potassium and magnesium. Those things are going to interfere in a, in an indirect way with energy production. So we do have to consider that whole spectrum, which I know isn't necessarily helpful, but you know I do think is the reality. And I would say, speaking of digestion, another thing to consider is the fact that we might not be absorbing everything that's coming in, especially if we're trying to rely on things like grains, nuts and seeds, and raw vegetables, which have anti-nutritional components, anti-nutrients like phytates and oxalates and lectins and whatnot, some of which are worse than others. And, you know, you actually, I would say, really want to look at within the category of the differences between them, but those can interfere with zinc, calcium absorption. You know, when we're talking the phytates and on the oxalate side that can interfere with calcium absorption among other minerals. Um, and we also, these things will increase the bacterial popul like harmful bacterial populations, including like E. coli, you know, there's, connections there with lectins. So that can not only interfere with the absorption of the vitamins and minerals in the food and interfere with their bioavailability, but also if they're interfering with our general gut health, that can impair our absorption of the vitamins and minerals coming in or the macronutrients coming in. Um, in general, I will say, I think there can be excessive focus on micronutrients. Of course, they're important and you know, kind of speaking to that, but at the same time, if we're eating a generally healthy diet, and I know it's hard to say that because that looks so different to different people, but a generally, I would say healthy bioenergetic diet, if we want to call it that, and we're in a generally good metabolic state, we do a much better job of maintaining our vitamin and mineral status. And we tend to lose a lot less. We're under a lot less stress. So we're excreting a lot less of those minerals like potassium and uh, magnesium that I mentioned. We're also going to be able to use the vitamins better that are coming in. For example, vitamin A, and thyroid tend to work together with cholesterol uh, conversion to steroids. And so, you know, having enough thyroid is important for the utilization of vitamin A. We also need to be careful of the metabolism. Of, you know, some of these different vitamins and minerals can be metabolized into relatively harmful downstream products, uh, including something like vitamin D, where if we're low in calcium and magnesium and our parathyroid hormone is high, we can convert the 25 hydroxy vitamin D to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which has some mm, suboptimal effects. And so, you know, causing like calcium bleaching from the bones and uh, immune activation, which is good if we have an infection and not good otherwise. And uh, so it's, again, we have this larger system, but if we get our, our metabolism to a good state, if we're generally low in stress and high in energy, we can worry a little bit less about the details. And I say that also because I've had people come to me who are taking, you know, a gram of magnesium uh, or more, and they need that to keep off, you know, to prevent cramping or to be able to sleep or whatever other symptom. 
And if that's the case, I mean, that's a massive amount of magnesium. This isn't a magnesium issue so much as it is a loss of magnesium issue or an issue with retaining magnesium. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's why I want to consider the whole system alongside the micronutrients. You, you mentioned B1, and, and um, I've been hearing a lot about high-dose B1 therapy. Uh, you know, I think Elliot Overton, uh, if you're familiar with him, is a big proponent of that, which he got from, I forget the researcher's name, Lonsdale, is that his name, who wrote the Dys Dysautonomia book. Is that the basis for it, is um, to basically provide that nutrition for uh, mitochondrial respiration? Yeah. Yeah. So B1 is involved in a few of the different enzymes in mitochondrial respiration. One of the more notable is pyruvate dehydrogenase. So in order to connect glycolysis, the first part of carb oxidation to the Krebs cycle and then the ETC, we need pyruvate dehydrogenase to be functioning. It's one of the more sensitive enzymes when it comes to mitochondrial respiration and having enough B1 is necessary there. Uh, there's a couple other places as well, but yeah, it, that's, I would say the main reason why it, it, it matters so much. Luke, got any questions about this topic? Uh, I mean, do you feel that a lack of minerals, essential minerals and vitamins is kind of a bottleneck for metabolic dysfunction? It definitely can be definitely. So you know, just using the B1 example, if we're functioning with suboptimal levels there, uh, you know, even not major, you know, maybe, maybe not a major deficiency, but just a percentage less than we need. And that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is working a percentage lower than we need it to work, working on a, you know, in a crippled system. So it definitely can be a bottleneck. And when we then consider poor food quality, uh, and what's going on with soil depletion of different vitamins and minerals and, you know, pesticide use and whatnot. I mean, it can be, and the reason I mentioned that is we don't have to grow healthy crops anymore, right? And we don't have to rotate them properly and, and mix them properly. We can just do a lot of monocropping and rely on pesticides to keep them alive and, and, uh, fertilizer, right. To, to keep them growing oftentimes at the cost of nutrition. So yeah, it is something that unfortunately, I mean, is is something that we do need to consider for sure. Let's jump into CO2. A lot of people are unaware uh, of its basically production during cellular respiration and, um, and how crucial it is for managing oxygen delivery and managing oxygen throughout that whole, that whole cycle. Um, lead us into this. We got a couple questions around this. Sure. So big picture wise, carbon dioxide is just as important a player as oxygen. They work in tandem and basically in order to uptake oxygen at the lungs and then deliver it to the cells, we need to have enough carbon dioxide coming from the cells and then being taken to the lungs. And this is due to what are called the Born Haldane effects, which have to do with how hemoglobin picks up and drops off oxygen. And essentially we need enough carbon dioxide in order to pick up and, and drop off the oxygen. So Oftentimes, if we're having an oxygenation issue, we think it's an oxygen problem, but really it could be, and often is, a carbon dioxide problem. And when it comes to the production of carbon dioxide, we produce it inside the, the cells um, and during mitochondrial respiration. And so we produce carbon dioxide in the Krebs cycle, and then we also produce it at that pyruvate dehydrogenase step. And because of this, there's a major difference in carbon dioxide production between carb utilization and fat utilization, where because we have this extra step of CO2 production from pyruvate dehydrogenase, which we don't use, we don't have that step in fat oxidation, we produce three carbon dioxides for every two that would be produced from, uh, from fat oxidation. And so we actually produce 50% more carbon, di carbon dioxide at the cell when we're using glucose. And that's assuming the same rate of respiration. And normally that's not actually an accurate assumption because the carb utilization tends to run faster. So it'd be even higher than 50% more carbon dioxide production. So that's kind of a, a starting framework uh, as far as oxygen getting to the cells and that being related to how much carbon dioxide we produce. And then that has impacts on, of course, if we're getting that oxygen delivery is necessary for producing energy. We need that oxygen in the ETC in the electron transport chain for energy production. So the, you know, 
this is a central piece when it comes to how well we're respiring, how well our mitochondria are performing energy production. And the reason we call it respiration is because of this involvement of oxygen. So that environment inside the cell that is sort of regulating the, you know, the, the carbon dioxide there that's regulating, this is like when you jumped on the call, this is kind of where Luke and I were talking at this point is, is that, that oxygen environment's regulated by carbon dioxide and um, <clears throat> whether or not it's hypoxic and then you shift to, so another part of this uh, sort of equation is the amount of oxygen present will determine whether pyruvate or lactic acid is produced. In, yeah, the, well, it is a determinant of whether that's the right. amount it's of oxygen in the cell. Yeah, yeah, right. because, you know, we were talking about other things that if they're blocking pyruvate dehydrogenase, for example, if you just have a B1 deficiency, that'll also cause it. Uh, so it, it is a factor where if the cell is not getting oxygen, then yes, it will prevent uh, it will prevent oxygen, uh, like oxidative phosphorylation of the glucose. And, and so that um, that amount of oxygen, whether that threshold is met or not, is determined by the presence of carbon dioxide. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if that's correct, then how much of that carbon dioxide is being supplied by mitochondrial respiration? And how much of that, or I don't even know if you could even figure this out, but and how poorly we are breathing. In other words, like how much CO2 we're blowing off if we're say mouth breathing, um, fast breathing. Um, they're both inputs obviously, because sort of one is like the exhaust, right? If we're, if we're like rapid mouth breathing, then we're blowing off a lot of CO2. So, uh, but you know, it also seems like if you're kind of in a fasted state, that's also going to debilitate your capacity to be, um, to have enough oxygen in that inside the cell. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to exactly to quantify it, but I would say that it's probably easier and quicker to cause hypoxia by hyperventilation than it is by lowering respiration, like mitochondrial respiration. So um, in other words, that would be a, I don't know, maybe a more potent way, a, a more potent determinant of CO2 levels. Got it. Um, Luke, any thoughts on CO2? Yeah, I wanted to touch on the oxidation of fat here. So you mentioned that you produce more CO2 molecules when you utilize glucose, which makes sense, right? You have glycolysis into the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transfer chain, whereas fats get shuttled directly into the mitochondria, right into the Krebs cycle. So you're seeing less CO2 production, but you're saying that because there's less CO2 available, the exchange between CO2 and oxygen is actually less efficient with less CO2. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Well, was, so then this ties into the whole bio, bioenergetic theory of in order to optimize our respiration, we need glucose as our substrate. So my question would be, if you're dealing with a patient who is severely overweight, has a lot of peripheral and visceral adipose tissue, you know, in order for them to shift their body composition in a direction that's advantageous, you need them to oxidize fat. So what does that process look like to you in terms of kind of the framework and the bioenergetic space? Yeah, so there's first, first thing I'll say is, we, our oxygen needs will also be dependent on our energetic needs in any tissue at any point. And so what we see when we compare fat and carb utilization is that fat utilization is perfect when we don't need a lot of energy in a short period of time. And it's okay if it's a little less efficient. It's okay if we get a little bit less oxygen or a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a little slower, the offloading of oxygen. And that's because in general, fat is a, is a better kind of low octane fuel compared to carbohydrates. So it's not inherently a bad and good, but an absence or a lack of carb burning is definitely bad is kind of the way I would think of it. And that's because certain tissues and all tissues at certain times will need to be able to utilize carbs. And so if we're not able to utilize them at that time, then we run into trouble. Now, when it comes to somebody who has excess adipose tissue, I think the first misconception is that there is a fat burning problem. And oftentimes that's not the case. And in states, you know, chronic health issues, whether we're talking obesity or 
uh, fatty liver disease is a really clear example where we actually see that fat burn, a lack of fat burning is not the problem. You actually see upregulated fat burning in that state and upregulated fat deposition at the same time. And so someone might say, well, that that doesn't sound right. How, how are both of those things happening at the same time? But the reason is that we are utilizing the fuel coming in so much less efficiently that we are storing much more of it as fat at the same time that our mitochondria are forced to use fat as a fuel instead of glucose. And so in the fatty liver state, for example, most of the fat that's there is coming from fat. It's actually coming from the fat stores. Um, 60% of it comes from our own de novo or our own uh, lipolysis from our own fat stores. And then it gets picked up by the liver. The liver is already in a fat burning state. It's excessively burning fat, but at the same time, it is not burning through the fuel very well. It's very inefficient. And so it is also storing fat. So in somebody who is dealing with the state of excess fat storage, they're typically stuck in a fat burning state, which is lowering the metabolic rate. And even though, again, they're burning more fat, they're storing more than they're burning. And you see this also in somebody who is even, so, even in a, in weight loss diets that compare low carb versus low fat, there's a, a really clear one from Kevin Hall where he looked at all these parameters and in the low carb diet, which was high fat, they were burning much more fat. They had much higher rates of lipolysis, much lower levels of insulin. And then in compared to the low fat, high carb group, that group was burning much less fat had much less lipolysis, much higher insulin, or relatively higher insulin. And yet the low carb, high fat group lost less body fat than the low fat, high carb group, despite the more fat burning and the more lipolysis. But that's because we're forgetting that other side of the equation, how much is being stored. And that's not only a utilization question, but also a hormone question, right? If we know that cortisol is one of the main things that increases fuel storage as, as you know, in the central adipose tissue, that's something else that'll influence that other side of the equation. But one of the main ways it's doing that is it's preventing our effective utilization of fuel in other tissues. And so there's all this extra to, to be stored as fat too. Now, when we come to this question of, okay, so somebody's in this state, how do we get out of the state if we're not trying to burn as much fat? And the short answer is, as I was saying earlier, it's not an all or nothing. And so maybe relative in the fuel percentage, we're burning 70% carbs and 30% fat. If we look at all the tissues throughout a whole day, that's more than enough, right? We don't need to be burning that much fat to be losing, uh, to be losing body fat, right? I mean, if we want to lose a pound in a week, we're talking about burning what 60 grams a day, right? Uh, of, of fat. And I mean, burning 60 more than we're than is being released, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that much. And so as long, we're always going to have a baseline level. And if somebody is, has excess body fat stores, they're already going to be releasing more fatty acids. And so there's going to be a higher utilization of fat as it is. Um, so they'll be burning more than somebody who's lean anyway, and we still can benefit from lowering that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not, I would say in that case, we're, we are in a debilitated state. That's what got us there. But in the way of shifting out, we don't want to force the fat burning. We just want to allow that low baseline level to be enough. And uh, and yeah, that's enough to allow for the fat loss. And even just a bit of walking or a bit of exercise will add on how much fat we're burning too. And so it really doesn't have to be all that much. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an awesome take. It's in complete juxtaposition to the kind of ketogenic metabolic flexibility theory where you know, they say that intermittent states of ketosis are beneficial for kind of mitochondrial flexibility, when in fact, it seems it's the opposite, that we need that glucose on board in order for the mitochondria to be able to see that full step and, you know, ultimately to product the production of ATP. Um, so yeah, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. And, and it's a feed forward state too. Everything that goes along with fat burning slows respiration. So we see it on the cellular level with the reactive oxygen species production, NAD to NADH ratio, and CO2 production and oxygenation. And then we also see it on the hormone level, lower levels of insulin, higher levels of glucagon, glucocorticoids, adrenaline, lower T4 to T3 conversion, typically lower testosterone, lower anabolic hormones. The whole body shifts in the same way that would in a famine or in a starvation state or in fasting, because that's what low carb diets mimic, we shift toward conservation of energy. And so, yeah, it's, it, we have the opposite. We have the feed forward system. You know, the idea that fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate, I think maybe is right for the wrong reasons, but I, I do think there's the truth there, which is that 
utilizing carbohydrates effectively increases our metabolic rate, partially due to the hormonal changes, but also due to the biochemical differences. And so, yeah, I would say that's, that's where the crux of the, of the question is, is can we fix our ability to do that? Yeah. And the only follow-up question I would have in the context of insulin resistance, how much of an issue is de novo lipogenesis? If it's an issue at all. Yes. So it's going to happen more in that state than in a healthy person. Right. But I would still say de novo lipogenesis is a problem in so much as we are not metabolizing carbohydrates well, but again, avoiding the carbs is not going to be the solution. And typically if somebody is consuming any amount of carbohydrates, the carbs are not the main fuel for fat storage. Like they're not the main substrate. Normally the fat will be used as, as body fat or as liver fat. And that's seen in the, you know, the labeling studies where they, you know, label the substrate coming in and see where it goes. And if somebody is not on a low carb diet, if they're consuming some amount of carbohydrates, it's the fat that gets stored as opposed to the carbs. And that's because it's a lot more efficient, right? To, to just take that fat and turn it into a triglyceride from a free fatty acid instead of the whole conversion process from through de novo lipogenesis. One of the things that we, uh, we were talking about even kind of zooming out even more is like total calorie intake and your sort of macro breakdown, you, you personally, Jay, and, um, and, and body fat percentage and structured workout, like that whole combination of things together seems, um, and I think I've heard you say in the past that you're somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 calories a day with two structured workouts. And, and I, I don't know, you don't seem like an overweight person to me, but you know, pretty low body fat percentage. And, uh, that's sort of a testament to the speed at which um, this respiration is occurring and, and the efficiency of it. Yeah. So, and that's a great way people can measure their metabolic rate. We were talking about, you know, insulin and glucose as markers of insulin sensitivity, but how many calories can you burn in a day without, or while maintaining your weight? I mean, that's the best measure typically, assuming there's not a major gut issue or something, because then we might not absorb all the calories, but that's typically a pretty good measure for where our metabolic rate's at. And we want to consider also if we're working out a lot, that'll also kind of artificially increase our needs. And that's not a, a representation of our metabolic rate. It's just, that's kind of, uh, we're just forcing that energy utilization. Uh, but yeah, and, and that was something that changed for me. When I was doing low carb and fasting, I was maintaining my weight at 2,400 calories a day. And I was right about the same weight as I am now. And I was also working out uh, at least twice as much. Plus I was, I was biking. I was much more active at that point. Whereas now, yeah, I do two structured workouts a week. And, uh, you know, some walking and, and a bit of running around and, you know, that kind of thing, but, um, you know, hiking on the weekends occasionally, but nothing too much more than that. Do you know what your basal metabolic rate is? Like what that number is for you? Based on like a, a test, like, uh, you know, when they do a metabolic cart test or something. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't done one. I'd be really curious to know and, and, to. To be able to see, I wish I had data from before and after, and I could actually see see uh, how it changed and if there's any differences in the testing apparatus versus my experience. But I've I've never done it, so I've done like you know the estimations based on body fat percentage and and all of that, you know, and and done you know a bod pod that identifies body fat, and, but it's all estimations at that point. Jay, do you kind of have a quick synopsis on on your opinion when it comes to exercise? If you have kind of a framework around it. So, I mean, general thoughts are we don't want to, we can't out exercise a bad environment or a bad diet and the general eat less exercise more paradigm, I think is a really harmful one. And I think we want to consider that that exercise is inherently stressful, but all those things being said, I think movement is very beneficial. And the more we're moving, the more we want to make sure that we're fueling ourselves for that movement. And if we're not fueling ourselves well, then that energy has to come from somewhere. And so this has been made particularly clear by Herman Ponzer, who has the constrained model of energy expenditure. And what he's found and uh, detailed in his research, which uh, is really notable looking in both animals and humans, is that when we, you, when we kind of like waste a lot of energy with exercise, if we aren't consuming enough food alongside it, that will inherently come at the cost of other organ systems. And it's not this additive model where 
we, you know, our basal metabolic rate was 2000 calories and we exercised 1000. And so, uh, and we only eat 2,500. So the whole diff, you know, then we've lost 500 calories of body fat. That isn't actually what happens. Instead, our body takes that away from our own quote, basal metabolic rate that goes to our own functions, our own, you know, repair and, and building of structure and being able to think clearly all of those things. And so, and this is notable to the point where I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but in, uh, in weaning, or maybe it was in, in like breastfeeding rodents or something, if they were forced to exercise, even given a lot of food, which was probably terrible food that they could only utilize so well. Anyway, they would actually cannibalize their own young at that point, because they need not only needed the energy from that, but they would not be able to support them, you know, like provide that energy for them. Uh, and there's, there's some other examples as well, like showing infertility in animals, if they exercise too much, and uh, things like that. And of course you see it in, in humans as well. And so what I'm kind of getting at here is we don't want to create a massive calorie deficit through lots of exercise. And instead we want to enjoy the benefits of exercise mentally, physically, you know, muscle mass, and myofascial effects and circulation effects and lymphatic system effects and whatever else we, you know, however else we benefit from it. But we want to make sure that we are making up for the stressful aspects by consuming enough food so that it's not coming at the cost of our brain function or digestive function or reproductive function. I think we maybe have time for one more topic. And um, I'd like to bring up uric acid. As I, I didn't really know much about this uh, a year ago. And then I started hearing all about it and how bad it was and, and fructose associations and and um, and. And that seemed to be the general consensus, like uric acid bad because fructose. And um, and then I listened to you and Mike talking about it and kind of deconstructing Lustig's work and um, Johnson's work and some what per Perlmutter's uh, preaching. And it just became even more sort of confusing, but also, you know, less, l less of a thing to worry about. So... Um, can you introduce people to uric acid and um, maybe what is what's going the prevailing ethos around it? Yeah, so uric acid is generally produced. Th there's a number of of kind of precursors, potential precursors to uric acid. These are the purines and alcohol and fructose, which are, I mean, just things that you're going to be getting in a normal diet. Um, you know, a lot of the purines are coming from protein sources, but there's concern about excess production of uric acid as something that can cause or contribute to gout. And as has been put forth by people like uh, Dr. Richard Johnson and Perlmutter, the suggestion that excess uric acid production also leads to issues like hypertension and insulin resistance and a number of other problems. And they generally point to fructose as a major driver of uric acid production. And they point to, you know, a number of different steps here, right? So fructose increasing uric acid production, uric acid production inherently being negative and problematic. And, in, and we are particularly sensitive to uric acid because we don't have the enzyme to break it down or as, you know, the same level from uricase. And so we are more prone to these excess uric acid levels. And all these things together point to fructose being something that causes a lot of weight gain. And in levels beyond small amounts is generally a poison or a toxin. At least that's how Dr. Lustig refers to it. And I don't, I don't know if I've heard Rich, Richard Johnson actually call it that, but that's kind of like the step, the stepwise thought process. And then they use certain evidence, like the idea that drugs like allopurinol, which block uric acid production in a very particular way that we can come back to, that's beneficial for hypertension and beneficial for a number of other issues. You know, that's supposed to be further evidence for the fact that uric acid is a problem and uric acid production is a problem. And uh, yeah, they, they point to some other things as well about, you know, animals that have the uricase, they're not as prone to these issues. And uh, But this is why, you know, this is how we got through our winters by fattening up on fructose. And that's kind of the general premise. And so uh, I think there's a lot of flaws in each part of, of that of the, of that explanation. And, okay. So, um, well, I guess we can start with uric acid Excel. Do you think that this is a substance that people need to be concerned with? So I would generally say 
overproduction of uric acid is a sign of a problem and excess uric acid can cause like the uric acid crystals, which can cause something like gout, but that is not kind of like with glucose or similar. I mean, I would, I would, I guess I want to make that strong of a, of a connection because I would say glucose is, is like extremely protective, but uric acid in normal amounts generally seems to have antioxidant effects. It actually tends to lower inflammation, even when it's administered. And so even the notion that excess uric acid, like in the cell or in a moment is a problem or that it is toxic or anything, I think is really far-fetched, especially considering that we have many times higher levels of uric acid than other animals and rodents and whatnot at baseline. And we've essentially selected for that as something that it functions as an antioxidant. Uh, and you see that like in the, in kind of the evolutionary pathways. And it's the same as apes. Apes are also the same way that they, uh, they also have these same high levels of uric acid because of this lack of uricase. And so I'd say overproduction is a sign of an issue. Excessive levels can contribute to something like gout, but in normal levels, uric acid is not at all harmful. Got it. Luke? No, I mean, uric acid is a little out of my wheelhouse. And, you know, I was originally introduced to it through Rick Johnson's work and how it's associated with fructose metabolism and purine metabolism, as you touched on. And so I had just identified, you know, uric acid is bad, but I'm understanding that, again, it might be kind of one of these other Goldilocks principle type molecules where, you know, I, it's associated with a lot of these different chronic diseases. And I think it's kind of blames a bad actor when in reality, it really isn't. And we need you know, some level of uric acid to work as an antioxidant within the body. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And the, the, again, the lines of evidence for this, I think are really faulty. And so I guess working backward, one of the main reasons why there's this blame on uric acid, let's say in hypertension is because the usage of this, um, this medication, this allopurinol lowers uric acid production and it has benefits. And so then there's this almost disingenuous connection made where they say, okay, well, uric acid is the problem. And what is failed to be mentioned by some of these people who are pointing to this is that uric acid can be produced through two different pathways from xanthine. One is xanthine oxidase and one is xanthine dehydrogenase. And the xanthine oxidase form produces reactive oxygen species in the process of producing uric acid and the dehydrogenase form doesn't. And it just it converts NAD to NADH. And in a stress state, when we're low in NAD and there's high calcium levels, we favor the xanthine oxidase, oxidase pathway. So this is in any state like hypertension, insulin resistance, degenerative states, we're favoring the quote harmful pathway. Allopurinol only blocks the harmful pathway. It doesn't block the, the non-harmful pathway, the xanthine dehydrogenase. So to say that allopurinol is beneficial, therefore uric acid is harmful, is is not actually an accurate depiction of what's happening. Instead, it's saying the production of, of uric acid through xanthine oxidase is harmful, likely due to the oxidative components, the reactive oxygen species produced by that enzyme, whereas the production of uric acid in normal conditions through xanthine dehydrogenase is totally independent of anything from allopurinol. So that's, again, kind of if we take those steps backward, um, that would be a, another reason to to question this notion that it's actually even a player in a state like hypertension and to say that it's a state it's a player in in a weight conversation is also especially problematic and again kind of skipping ahead but it's something that i think is a good starting example is when we look at apes when we look at chimps where firstly they're consuming massive amounts of fructose more than you know any of us would typically consume is they'll consume 60 to 100% of their diet as fruit for the entire year, depending on what's available. And the more fruit that's available, the higher that percentage is. So sometimes it's as much as hundred percent. And as I was saying, they also lack uricase. So for one, if it was as simple as fructose increases uric acid and the more fructose, the more uric acid, these chimps would all have massive amounts of gout and they would all be dropping dead due to, you know, heart issues as a result of hypertension and, and all of that. But then the other thing is they would be really fat. That's one of the whole points is that this is supposed to be a pathway that increases fat storage and increases insulin resistance. And yet they're incredibly lean, like, like 0.3% body fat, 0.1% body fat. Um, 
compared to us where even a bodybuilder has 10 times as much at least uh you know than the 0.3 than the the female bonobos uh compared to you know when it comes to the males you know a a, a male bodybuilder is still going to have as much as 40 times as much body fat as an average bonobo who is eating mostly fruit and doesn't have you know lacks the same uricase that we do and so again just just looking at those kinds of of places without even getting into the details of the physiology, it just, it, it's, it just does not line up. It really just doesn't line up. Right. So the prescription of a drug like allopurinol designed to lower uric acid levels, the resolution of symptoms in that patient is not a, a result of the lower uric acid, but as a result of a lower xanthine oxidase. Exactly. And do we, yeah. do we have a way to measure xanthine oxidase in the blood? That's a good question. I have no idea. And I don't know how much of it would be in the blood, right? I mean, it would, it probably should like stay in the tissues. If it's in the blood, it might be a sign of like cell damage or death, but yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure. But then, so, and then even backing up from there, when we actually dig into the physiology of whether fructose increases uric acid, the, that entire premise relies on this idea that fructose is going to deplete ATP. And the reason for this is that the first step of fructose metabolism in comparison with glucose, well, both of them involve ATP conversion to ADP, but the idea is that there's not regulation at that step in the liver when it comes to fructose like there is with glucose. And so when you have fructose, you're going to cause this massive ATP depletion, that's going to increase uric acid. And hypothetically, you could say that that's the case in a, in a situation of massive fructose consumption, but in practice, it doesn't happen. And instead in practice, for one, you don't typically see ATP depletion from fructose unless there's a really deranged state. And instead it typically increases ATP production because all of the steps later on using fructose to produce energy produces lots of ATP. So to cause ATP depletion, you would have to have massive blocks with the further utilization of fructose and then be consuming a lot of fructose. And in human populations where you look at this, it's nearly impossible. I mean, it's very, very difficult to increase uric acid as a result of fructose consumption. They have to take people who are already overweight or pre-diabetic or diabetic or insulin resistant. They have to tell them not to exercise. And then they have to give them a couple hundred grams of pure fructose a day on top of what they're already eating in fructose sweetened beverages and other things like that in order to see any amount of increase in uric acid. And it's, it has nothing to do with anything we could even eat as humans, considering that when we're talking fructose sweetened beverages, it's just pure fructose. And we don't consume pure fructose in, in any foods, you know, in a soda and high fructose corn syrup, those are all about 50, 50 fructose to glucose. And if at most it's like 55, 45 with high fructose corn syrup. And when you give pure fructose, uh, it's very poorly absorbed. And what we have here is then an endotoxin issue because we're not absorbing anything more than maybe 15 grams of pure fructose at a time. And all of the rest of that is feeding bacteria, causing massive increases in endotoxin, which then inhibit mitochondrial respiration at the liver and will cause increases in uric acid and de novo lipogenesis. And you see that same thing with these same arguments when it comes to the fat production through de novo lipogenesis, where you really only see that in rats that have very low liver function compared to ours and that are under the influence of endotoxin because of pure fructose being given, which then feeds bacteria and increases endotoxin. And, and this is actually like borne out, you know, they, they've parsed all of this out where if they provide antibiotics to prevent the bacterial issue and prevent the endotoxin production, even despite the poor fructose absorption, there's no issue. There's no fat production at the liver. Um, I don't know if they've looked at it with uric acid specifically, but it's the same, you know, pathway, same, same implication. So most of the concern here with fructose is either a really a misapplication of certain hypothetical pathways being emphasized. And then B is, is either not considering the real world research or just again, ignoring what's actually the driving factor in that research, which is not the fructose itself, but rather in often case endotoxin. And even with a lot of endotoxin production and pure fructose um, administration, it's still really hard to increase your acid from fructose. Awesome. We covered a lot of ground. Definitely. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to get interrupted here shortly uh, with my kids running in. So um, we should close it out. Any any uh, final thoughts, Jay, Luke? 
No, I no, think nothing that was else. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was, I think it was a great conversation. And for reference, I know sometimes it can be hard to put these into practical, you know, diet advice, all, all of the different principles. And so I do have a food guide that people can use. It's a one page infographic and there's, you know, kind of use a spectrum for how much foods might benefit us metabolically. And also if we have gut issues, how we might want to categorize foods differently and, you know, which ones we want to be more careful about. So for listeners, they can sign up for that at jfeldmanwellness.com slash guide. Yeah, it's awesome. I have downloaded that. It's a great reference infographic. So definitely check that out. Check out Jay's podcast, Energy Balance Podcast. I've probably listened to 50, 60 episodes at this point. Um, it's wonderful. And you have a course too? Yeah, yeah. So if people are looking for more help, you know, I always recommend start with, you know, just getting acquainted with the ideas and, you know, making small changes. And there's a lot of free content. And then I do offer some services to help you know, people beyond that. And I, I help people as a health coach and work with men and women dealing with all sorts of different issues. And so I have an eight week course, which is normally my recommended starting place. I, uh, and that's called the energy balance course. I also have a group coaching program called the energy balance solution. And uh, so those would be my recommended uh, places to to go. And I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. And all of that can be found at the services page on my website. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Jay. And uh, good luck with everything. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks, Jay. It was great meeting you. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, you too.